In this lecture, we're going to talk about the seizure medications or the anticonvulsants that are used in the treatment of epilepsy. And this is certainly one of the most common, if not the most common, area of pharmacology that would be asked on step one from neurology, probably along with the Parkinson's medications. And so when I was a medical student, I think there were four seizure medications we learned about. And um, I have seriously whittled down and left out um, multiple anticonvulsants to try to really highlight the ones that are commonly used. And so um, in terms of seizure classification, remember I mentioned that the simple or focal um, onset seizures, or rather partial or focal, have a specific treatment as compared to the generalized onset seizures. And so here we can see that with all of the focal onset seizures, we have older seizure medications at work and newer. And new here is kind of misleading because these medications have all been around for, uh, well, except for lecosamide, well over 10, 15 years. Um, boards tend to still be stuck with the older seizure medications, even though somewhat we're shifting away from those because of uh, more long-term side effects. But in terms of treatment of focal or partial onset seizures, we have carbamazepine, phenytoin, phenobarbital, and valproate or valproic acid. And then our newer seizure medications we will go through over here. All right, and so this would be the same whether we're dealing with a partial complex seizure or a focal seizure that has secondary generalization. When we move on to the generalized onset seizures, um, you can see that for absence, the drug of choice here is ethosuximide, okay, but we can also use uh, lamotrigine, which is a um, so-called newer <laughs> seizure medication. Valproic acid is an older one that could also work. And uh, you can see that valproate or valproic acid really works for all of the generalized onset seizures. And if we go back here to the partial or focal onset, you also see valproic acid or valproate here. So this is a broad spectrum medication, one of the older ones. All right, and then we can see um, several of these newer uh, anticonvulsant medications also work for generalized seizures. So um, in general, the newer seizure medications tend to be more broad spectrum. They work for both um, focal onset and generalized onset seizures. Whereas a lot of the older ones, like carbamazepine, phenytoin, gabapentin, really only work for the partial or focal onset seizures. So notice this list here, back for the uh, focal onset seizures, that um, these medications, carbamazepine, phenytoin, um, and over on the newer list, oxcarbazepine, gabapentin, um, these are not helpful for generalized onset seizures. And so it is important as we go through this handout that you remember which ones can be used for the partial focal onset, which ones can be used for the generalized onset, and which ones can be used for both. All right, so in terms of treatment of partial or focal onset seizures, in general, these act by inactivating voltage-gated sodium channels. So that tends to quiet down neuronal hyperexcitability, which you see in seizures, and they also tend to enha enhance the action of GABA. Remember, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so if we enhance the action of that, it tends to quiet down overactive neurons. In terms of generalized onset seizures, many of these, the action is against the voltage-gated calcium channels, um, especially in the thalamic neurons. And so um, the action here is to um, prevent the um, release of excitatory neurotransmitters by blocking the entry of calcium. There are multiple other mechanisms of actions, as we'll see, for the generalized onset seizures. Now, this is a really nice drawing that a student did for me last year to try to show on one page the different seizure medications and the mechanism of action. So we have an excitatory neuron, a postsynaptic neuron, an inhibitory neuron, 
And I would suggest when we're done with this lecture, come back to this slide and kind of go through as just a visual aid um, to look at um, different seizure medications and where they act. So we'll see we have a large group of medications that act against these um, voltage-gated sodium channels, again, to quiet down neuronal excitability. We have medications that act against the voltage-gated calcium channels. Um, there are some medications that act against these um, SV2A 2A receptors. And this is important for packaging, uh, we think, of excitatory neurotransmitters. So if you block that, then you're not going to have release of as much excitatory neurotransmitters. So there's really one medication that has that mechanism of action. Uh, we'll see lamotrigine here acts by blocking glutamate, an excitatory neurotransmitter. Okay, and topiramate has multiple actions here. Look at all the asterisks here with topiramate. It acts against sodium channels. It acts against AMPA-A, which, remember, is uh, glutamate has multiple receptors here, like NMDA and AMPA. And so topiramate uh, acts as an AMPA-A antagonist. Okay, and then we see topiramate out here again now as a GABA agonist. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so we enhance that. Again, we quiet down overactive neurons. Uh, we won't talk about um, ty tiagapine here, which is a GABA reuptake inhibitor, but we will mention valproic acid here, again, having many different mechanisms of actions, including to inhibit the breakdown of GABA. Okay, so I know all of that was overwhelming, but as, after we go through the lecture, come back and uh, look over this, uh, I think, helpful illustration. So let's start with um, phenytoin. Now, certainly for questions that I will ask you and for step one, you need to know the generics. So phenytoin. When you get into the third and fourth year, everyone will be talking about dilantin. Okay, but you need to know the generics, phenytoin. So this is only helpful for partial or focal onset seizures, and the action is against these voltage-gated sodium channels. All right, so um, for some of these medications, understanding the mechanism of action is really important, um, for boards especially, and so that's certainly the case with phenytoin. So it is metabolized in the liver. It's a very strong enzyme inducer, and so therefore it decreases the concentration of other medications, and um, I, I will list these a few times just because uh, it's really important. This can have a, you know, obviously dramatic effect here that it's helpful to know that it decreases the concentration of oral contraceptives and um, warfarin, which is a blood thinner. Okay, so you need to be aware of that if you're starting a patient on phenytoin. It's highly protein bound. And in just a minute, I'll give you an illustration of how if we use phenytoin with another seizure medication, we can get into an issue because of the high protein binding. So it has a half-life of 24 hours. So roughly in about five days after starting someone on phenytoin, you can assess a blood level and meaningfully see about where they're at on that medication. Now phenytoin has a very um, unique property that we only see uh, with this medication. So. Enzymes eliminate phenytoin under first-order kinetics until they get saturated. And so this could be here just oral. It does not have to be an injection. Okay, but notice that the rate of clearance here of the phenytoin follows first-order kinetics, and drug clearance is perfectly in proportion to concentration of the medication. But what happens with phenytoin is once the enzyme reaches it, that uh, breaks it down gets saturated past a certain point, it then moves into zero order kinetics. Okay, and so we reach that point of saturation here, and now the rate of clearance does not continue up in that linear fashion. And so what happens is you can have a rapid rise in the blood level of phenytoin once you've reached that point. So just as an example, um, Let's say we have a patient here on this dose of phenytoin. Um, 300 milligrams is kind of a, a usual dose, but their blood level is too low. Okay, we want to be up a little higher. Um, and so you increase the dose, maybe from 300 to 400, thinking that's not too much of an increase. But then the patient 
over time gets toxic. All right, so whenever we make a change in the dose of phenytoin, it's very important that we follow up and check a blood level relatively soon because you don't know when that point of saturation is going to occur. So we have to very carefully follow blood levels because of this property of non-linearity of elimination kinetics. So that's unique. Now as we go through these medications, it will be important that you keep in mind which ones can be also given intravenously. And the reason is, if we can give it IV, then it's effective for the treatment of status epilepticus. Remember, that's a neurologic emergency. Someone's having recurring seizures, so you need to give them an IV dose. And so we can give phenytoin IV, but it's also available in a form called phosphenytoin. And this can be given three times faster than regular old IV phenytoin. So for status epilepticus, we'll use phosphenytoin. Phenytoin has a lot of side effects. And remember, patients can get toxic quite easily. And so when phenytoin levels are toxic, it affects the cerebellar vestibular apparatus. So patients feel drunk. Uh, they complain of dizziness. They're, they, their walking is very unsteady. They're throwing up. And uh, last year, I mentioned this as a medication that can cause nystagmus. And so if we have a patient on phenytoin, I always check their eyes. And if you see nystagmus, it suggests maybe they're taking too much phenytoin, and you better get them to the lab and see if they might be toxic. Um, as levels get higher, patients can be very drowsy and can even lead to coma. Another potential uh, side effect of phenytoin is Stevens-Johnson syndrome and the toxic epidermal necrolysis. So I'll show you a few pictures of that. Also, we do need to be careful uh, when we load patients with IV phenytoin or phosphenytoin because it can trigger cardiac arrhythmias and hypotension. All right, so Stevens-Johnson, when the skin detachment is less than 10%, we would use the term Steven Johnson syndrome. If it's more than 30%, we would call it a toxic uh, epidermal necrolysis. So that usually starts fairly early on um, after you've begun therapy with phenytoin. So it's not very common, but um, obviously it would be very, very serious. So you, you'd want to warn patients, you know, if they're having any skin changes um, to let you know right away. Chronic side effects are also common. Right, so these are patients who maybe they're not having acute toxicity, but they've been on this medication for a long time. And so the most common probably is gingival hyperplasia. So it's very important that patients who are on phenytoin have really good um, oral hygiene. You know, they, they see a dental hygienist regularly. Several years ago, it was found that if patients take folic acid, the incidence of gingival hyperplasia is much, much lower. So you really should always prescribe folic acid in patients who are on phenytoin. All right, so that gingival hyperplasia side effect would be a common board question. Phenytoin can also cause unwanted hair growth. Uh, remember from our neuropathy lecture, it's a medication that can cause peripheral neuropathy. And another reason not to prescribe this if you can avoid it, especially in women, is that it can cause bone loss. Um, well, men also, but since osteoporosis is more common in women, um, you know, just think about a 30-year-old patient who has epilepsy, and that patient is going to need to be on a seizure medication for many, many years, perhaps their whole life. And so why choose one that would cause chronic bone loss if you could avoid it? Now, carbamazepine, um, again, very important, you know, the mechanism of action for boards just like phenytoin, it works for partial or focal onset seizures. Same mechanism of action against the sodium channels. It's also highly protein bound and is an enzyme inducer. Okay, so a lot of overlapping features. Side effect profile is a little different. Now, if patients do get to toxic levels, they can also have that vertigo, nausea, vomiting, staggering gait um, kind of a thing. But uh, probably the, the two most important um, that I would uh, remember here for carbamazepine is that it can cause aplastic anemia. So we do need to monitor blood counts periodically um, every few months or so in patients on carbamazepine. And if their blood counts get too low, 
then you better change into something else. And it can also cause SIADH. Okay, so occasionally check electrolytes uh, to check for um, hyponatremia. Stevens-Johnson syndrome and the TEN syndrome can also occur with carbamazepine. This uh, is more common in individuals with uh, Asian ancestry. And so um, if we're going to start carbamazepine in that situation, you would first want to check for the HLA-B1502 allele. All right, if patients have that, you should not start them on carbamazepine. Phenobarbital is an older anticonvulsant medication that uh, really we don't use anymore uh, with the exception of status epilepticus. And that's down here. You can see it can be given in intravenous form. So that is pretty much now its only indication um, for seizures. Phenobarbital acts um, on the GABA receptor by increasing the duration of response. Okay, so it increases the duration of um, chloride channel opening on the GABA receptor. Okay, that'll be important to remember as we contrast this with the mechanism of action of benzodiazepines, which also work on the GABA receptor, receptor but in a different way. One reason we don't use phenobarbital very much is it's just not as effective as the other seizure medications. Um, it also has a whopping 96-hour half-life. So when you're starting this medication, it takes upwards of three weeks to get to a um, steady state. Phenobarbital tends to be rather sedating. Patients feel dopey. If you use it in children, there are studies that show they don't perform as well in school. Occasionally, kids can even have this paradoxical hyperreactivity, where they're just, even though it's sedating, they're hyperactive on the medication. If patients take too much, they look like someone who's toxic on phenytoin. Okay, so that, you know, nystagmus, dizzy, drunk, nausea, vomiting um, sort of presentation. I mentioned primidone here um, not because it's used as a seizure medication. Many, many decades ago it was used as a seizure medication, but I wanted to just remind you here that its indication, its only indication today is for essential tremor. So primidone is metabolized to phenobarbital um, and something else, but uh, I don't think you need to know that. Uh, I just wanted to sort of remind you of its use for essential tremor. Now, valproic acid has multiple different mechanism of action. That's why it's broad spectrum. It works for partial and also for generalized onset. So it works on the sodium channels, just like phenytoin and carbamazepine but also works on these low threshold calcium currents. So that makes it effective for generalized onset seizures. And it increases GABA levels, probably by breaking, uh, inhibiting the breakdown of GABA. All right, so it works for both. So that's, that's good, it's broad spectrum. It's an enzyme inhibitor. And so it can increase the concentrations of other medications, especially a very commonly used anticonvulsant we're going to come to in just a minute here, known as lamotrigine. So again, it's broad spectrum, and it's available in IV form, which again makes it useful for um, status epilepticus. Now, side effects of valproic acid. Um, so GI side effects are fairly common, sedation, but uh, more important here, the third one down, it very commonly causes tremor and even Parkinsonism. And so, at least in my own experience, this would probably make a top five list of medications that cause tremor. And so, you need to be aware of that because valproic acid is a commonly prescribed medication because it works not only for seizures, um, it helps to prevent migraines, and psychiatrists use it all the time for mood stabilization. Okay, so, need to know the side effect profile. Of all the seizure medications that um, we have discussed, this is the most likely to cause weight gain. Okay, so would not want to uh, put that on someone, this medication on someone who's obese. It also commonly causes elevation of liver enzymes, up to 40% of patients. And especially in kids who are on multiple 
other seizure medications, it can cause what's known as a fatal fulminant hepatitis. So point is, avoid it in patients who have any kind of a liver problem. Okay, it can also cause acute pancreatitis. Um, interestingly, every 10 years, I have to take my neurology board recertification examination, and that was a question that they asked. They wanted you to know it could cause acute pancreatitis. Um, now, I mentioned uh, in the very first slide, there was an asterisk by valproic acid. Um, of all the seizure medications, this is the last one you would want to have a woman you know, during childbearing ages on because it's highly associated with neural tube defects more than any of the other anticonvulsants. So in general, um, avoid using this medication in that setting. So it's highly protein bound. Remember, phenytoin is highly protein bound. And so we get into this unique problem when we combine valproic acid with phenytoin, which sometimes occurs. Um, and so you just need to be aware of that because um, here's the thing. When you measure a phenytoin level, you want to see how much, um, you know, if the medication is in the right dosing range. Um, because valproic acid displaces phenytoin from protein, and I should have said when you measure a phenytoin level, you're measuring the phenytoin that's bound to protein. All right, so when a patient's on valproic acid, um, it can be difficult to interpret the phenytoin level. Someone may appear toxic on phenytoin. You know, they've got nystagmus, they're staggering, but you get your phenytoin level and it's not that elevated. Well, if the patient's on valproic acid, then you need to do what's called a free phenytoin level. So you're assessing not just the protein bound, but also the free amount. Okay, so the point is the patient may look toxic, but you can't trust your blood levels. Get a free phenytoin level in that situation. So you can use these two medications together. It's kind of a lab thing that you need to be aware of. Ethosuximide is the drug of choice for absence seizures. And so its action is against these uh, voltage gated or T calcium channels. It's usually well tolerated, but it can cause some sedation. And uh, there are some reports of Steven Johnson syndrome. Okay, main thing for boards is that you associate this with treatment of absence seizures. Now, benzodiazepines are not used for prevention of seizures, unlike all of the other medications um, that we're talking about here. These are only used for status epilepticus because they don't last very long. Okay, we're just trying to knock out status epilepticus. So diazepine or lorazepam are the two that are used. And generally, you know, if we're seeing someone in the emergency room with status epilepticus, this is the first thing we're going to go to, to try to quickly stop the seizure activity. Uh, remember I mentioned in the last lecture that patients who take benzodiazepines for sleep or maybe to prevent uh, or treat panic attacks, if they abruptly stop these medications, withdrawal seizures are very common as well. Right, so benzodiazepines like phenobarbital act on GABA, but um, they act by increasing the frequency of chloride channel opening. Remember, phenobarbital acts by uh, affecting the duration of chloride channel opening. So benzodiazepines are very sedating, you know, that's why they're used for sleep. And we do need to be careful that we give the right dose of this when we're treating status epilepticus, because it can cause respiratory depression and even death if um, too much is given. And there have been sad cases of patients who um, had pseudo seizures in the emergency room. They weren't even having true seizures and the patient was given too much benzodiazepines caused respiratory depression and death. All right, so here's a nice drawing here of the GABA receptor. Here's the GABA binding site. You know, here's the chloride channel. So again, we have our barbiturates and our benzodiazepines. And just remember the difference of either affecting duration of chloride channel opening or frequency of chloride channel opening.
Lamotrigine is a seizure medication that is commonly used because it's generally very well tolerated. And so it, it does several things. It inhibits release of glutamate and also acts on the voltage um, uh, sodium channels, just like phenytoin or carbamazepine. So it's broad spectrum, works for both the partial and the generalized onset. Um, one downside to lamotrigine is when you start this medication, it takes about five weeks for you to get up to a therapeutic range. So although we really like this medication, it's well tolerated. If you have someone that's just having frequent seizures, you know, you want to get control of things sooner. You don't want to wait five weeks. That would be a reason maybe not to choose this medication. Now, lamotrigine is another medication that has a significant interaction with valproic acid. And it turns out valproic acid uh, greatly increases the levels of lamotrigine. And so if we're using lamotrigine and valproic acid together, you need to be very careful. Well, there's a table that we can look up to see exactly how you titrate if you're adding one of these medications onto the other, but you would do it much more slowly than normal. So the only side effect I warn patients about who are on lamotrigine is that it can cause a relatively benign rash in about 10%. Uh, less common, it can cause Stevens-Johnson or even the 10 syndrome. So you'd want to warn patients about any skin changes. It's very safe. Remember that interaction with um, valproic acid or Depakote. And lamotrigine is, appears to be quite safe during pregnancy. So again, a younger woman who needs an anticonvulsant, this would be a good choice. Leviteracetam, very commonly used. Um, in fact, it seems to be the seizure medication that neurosurgeons always use. But it's broad spectrum. It works for partial and generalized onset seizures. Um, it's available in IV form. So again, we can use that in status epilepticus. Unlike uh, lamotrigine, it kicks in quickly. Within days of starting someone on oral levetiracetam, they're already starting to get into a therapeutic range. So in someone who's having more frequent seizures, uh, that would be a good thing. The mechanism of action is um, uh, not entirely clear, but I mentioned early it does tend to bind uh, to the synaptic vesicle SV2A, which we think inhibits the packaging of excitatory neurotransmitters and therefore decreases the release of excitatory neurotransmitters. The unique side effect of levetiracetam is mainly behavioral. So it will often cause irritability, and especially if patient, patients have underlying anxiety or depression, it may worsen that. So that would be a reason maybe not to choose levetiracetam if a patient has significant mental health, health issues, uh, perhaps choose something else. Topiramate is one of the most commonly prescribed medications in neurology because it's an effective anticonvulsant, and it also is a great medication for migraine prevention. So it acts on the sodium channels, just like phenytoin and carbamazepine. It also acts to enhance GABA, and it also acts against the glutamate receptor AMPA. Okay, so it does several things that makes it broad spectrum for both partial and generalized onset seizures. Side effects of topiramate are unique. So these are really worthwhile remembering, again, especially because it's commonly used. So it is a, um, acts as a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. And so that means that numbness and tingling are very common. That's usually around the mouth, fingertips. So you always need to warn patients about that because uh, otherwise they'll get very worried. It can sometimes improve um, after they've been on the medication for a period of time. But for some patients, that numbness is so annoying, they'll, they will stop the medication. Now, topiramate, interestingly, acts as an appetite suppressant. So weight loss, which is generally on the order of eight, or 10 pounds, and then it usually stabilizes, is common. Uh, many patients will find that as an upside of uh, topiramate. So maybe if someone is obese, this would be a reason you might want to choose topiramate. Um, I have had twice uh, in my career where I've had to stop this medication because the patient just kept losing weight and it was not um, re reaching a point where it wasn't safe.
Some patients refer to uh, this medication, uh, so the other term is Topamax, Topiramate or Topamax, and some patients will call it Dopamax because it makes them feel dopey. Um, it's not just that it can cause confusion, but more specifically, it tends to be word-finding difficulty. Okay, so these patients just can't come up with the right word in conversation. Um, again, this is not that common, but this is probably the most common reason that I will stop this medication. Um, I had a teacher not too long ago that just couldn't even communicate in class. So you'd want to warn patients about that, and certainly if they're experiencing that, you'd stop the medication. Uh, not commonly, but it can cause kidney stones, and very rarely can cause um, a secondary angle closure glaucoma. I've never seen that. Now, topiramate um, can cause a reduction in um, estradiol concentrations, so uh, we want to communicate with the patient's primary doctor if uh, we're prescribing this medication. You may need to make an adjustment. Gabapentin is another very, very commonly prescribed medication, um, certainly in the top five, I would say, of all neurology medications. Uh, as the name indicates, it was designed as a GABA agonist, but that doesn't appear how it acts. It probably acts against the voltage-gated calcium channels, although um, that's not universally agreed on. So you're not going to be asked about the mechanism of gabapentin because people can't agree on that. But it works only for partial onset seizures. It's not actually used that often for seizures. Um, it may not be as effective as other medications you could use for partial onset seizures. So why is it so commonly used? It's used for many different pain syndromes. Um, peripheral neuropathy pain, um, you know, radiculopathies, um, all kinds of different pain syndromes. So that's mainly why it's used. Although sometimes if a patient has neuropathy and then they also develop seizures, you could potentially use this medication since it works for both problems. Side effects are rather nonspecific. It can be a little sedating, can cause some dizziness and fatigue. These aren't unique or specific, so um, they don't stand out like the side effects of topiramate, for example. Oxcarbazepine, um, as the name indicates, is very similar to carbamazepine. So um, it can also cause hyponatremia, Stevens-Johnson syndrome. But an advantage here, unlike carbamazepine, it's not an enzyme inducer. And so we don't get into the problem with interaction of other medications. It's also much less likely to cause aplastic anemia, which is a good thing. It's only available in oral form. And like carbamazepine, it's only available for partial onset seizures. All right, and then finally, lacosamide. Lacosamide is um, basically just like phenytoin and carbamazepine in terms of mechanism of action. Again, it acts against the sodium channels. So like both of those medications, it only works for the partial or focal onset seizures. Um, an advantage of lacosamide is that it's available um, also in IV form and um, generally is much better tolerated than uh, phenytoin. Now just one point about using seizure medications during pregnancy. And so I tried to make a big point here about valproic acid being the worst. All right, so we would want to avoid that. You know, if um, uh, I don't start it in younger women, just because they may tell you there's no chance they're gonna get pregnant, but you don't know what's going to happen a year down the road. So again, try to avoid that in younger women. It has the highest risk of neural tube defects. Most of the other medications kind of fit, you know, in this middle range here. You can see that phenytoin, phenobarb, topiramate have a little higher risk than carbamazepine and oxcarbamazepine. And down here, the safest medications are lamotrigine, and it looks like levetiracetam is also... Um, quite safe during pregnancy. So again, in women of childbearing age, if you need to start a seizure medication, um, we'd want to use one of these two. Okay, and the last point here, remember for treatment of status epilepticus, we need to know what medications can be given intravenously.
So those are phenytoin or phos and phosphenytoin. Remember that we can give that three times faster. Phenobarbital, valproic acid, the benzodiazepines like lorazepam and diazepam, levetiracetam, and lecosamide. And so here is kind of, um, well, and here all of the others can't be given intravenously. So here's generally our approach to status epilepticus. Um, if someone comes in with recurrent seizures, and usually in adults, like I mentioned last time, they have a brief seizure, they don't wake up, then they have another brief seizure, that is status epilepticus. You first come in with IV benzodiazepines, and probably lorazepam is used more often. Okay, and you don't need to know dosing or anything like that. Okay, if we're not able to control the seizures, you know, within five minutes or so with a benzodiazepine, we would then move on to IV phosphenytoin. Now, some neurologists would actually use something else, but I think most are still using phosphenytoin as our next kind of go-to uh, medication. Okay, and there's a specific loading dose that we give, and if that doesn't work, we give another loading dose. Okay, if the patient's seizures still are not controlled, and remember, this is a neurologic emergency because, you know, we can have neuronal death as, you know, as that seizure continues on. At this point, we need to then intubate the patient because anything else you're going to give the patient causes respiratory depression. So we first intubate the patient, and then we can give a medication like IV phenobarbital, or you can use IV valproic acid or levetiracetam. You've got a lot of other options here, and I don't think you need to worry about all of the other options um, after that, um, because neurologists often don't agree on where to go from there. So what's most important here? In status epilepticus, if you're an emergency room doctor, you need to know about giving benzodiazepines aggressively, use the right dose. If that doesn't work, phosphenytoin, then intubate the patient. And then generally after that, neurology is going to be involved with recommending the anticonvulsants to use from there.